Good afternoon, and thank you for coming along to today's talk on how to win an AI hackathon without using AI. So my name's Colin Gillespie, and I'm the co-founder of Jumping Rivers. Now, Jumping Rivers isn't a water company, uh, we just quite like the name. It is, in fact, a data science, machine learning, AI consultancy based in the northeast of England. And we've been around for four years, and we work with a variety of companies, uh, some in the water industry, but others that, such as banks, governments, pharmaceutical companies, all sorts of, 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 of different organisations who are using data. Now, this talk is based on a hackathon from two years ago, and it was run by Northumbrian Water. So they run an innovation festival each year, and they were interested in, well, they were interested in a variety of things, but one of them was leakage, which was a hack that we talked, about, which was a hack that we did. And in this innovation festival, which was around about July at Gosford Racecourse, they had around 15 different hacks, some data focused, others on more sort of building a, a widget, building a solution, all trying to help the water industry. And the way it was structured was we had two days of background material. So there was myself and my colleague Seb Meller, and we sat through two days of background material with, with, different, uh, with different points of view on the problem at hand. And then we had two hack days. So I think it was Monday and Tuesday with the background, and then Wednesday, Thursday with the, with the hack days. And although we had two hack days, the second half of the second day was actually used for presenting our solution. So really it was only one and a half hack days. And in total, for the hack that we were in, there were 10 teams. Okay, so we're on a hack on leakage and there were around about 10 teams. The hackathon goal was that Northumbrian Water wanted to reduce the leaks by 20%. Okay, and that's, I suppose, quite a nice, simple goal to get ahead around of. We just want to have less waste. And in order to do that, we were given access to an Azure drive on the Wednesday morning. So we got a username and password, and we could mount this drive filled with data, around about sort of five gigabytes worth of data, onto our laptops and download it. And this is what it felt like. You were just presented with a bunch of folders and inside each folder, there were more folders and you went down the rabbit hole of, of what's in this drive. And the sorts of stuff that we had was lots of spatial data, as you might imagine. So <coughs> inside Northumberland Water, they manage regions or they manage sort of, uh, groups of houses inside DMAs or district metered areas, and these are spatial polygons. Right? And these are quite important because lots of that's a sort of the unit of measurement was how much leakage in a district meter area or what sort of type was a DMA. And a DMA was round about sort of five or six postcodes, but these varied in size because, well, they've evolved over the years. We had time series data. So sometimes it was things like flow rate through pipes. So that was every 15 minutes. Other times it was weather, so it was a bit more coarse, uh, but we had lots of, of time series data. We had leakage estimates, so it's how much do Northumberland Water think they're leaking at any particular time. Now, the way they estimate leakage was, at this current time, somewhat uh, basic. Essentially, they looked at how much water was being used at around about three o'clock in the morning, and that was going to be the best guess for leakage. So you can imagine that at Christmas time, when people are up during the night, they had more leaks, or when it was hotter weather, leaks seemed to increase. Right? So they knew this was, wasn't great, but that was the best they had. With flow rates, so that was the amount of water going in and out of a DMA, this district meter area. We had usage, how much water was being used, and you can imagine how it would be seasonal, uh, both in terms of, of a week and also in terms of the year. We had reported leaks. So this was someone phoning up saying, there's a leak outside my house, please come and fix it. We had pipe size. So pipes were measured in terms of metric, imperial, US imperial, uh, Roman imperial. They seem to have every possible measurement known to man. We had pipe location. This was more a, a general indication where the pipe was as opposed to an exact location, as you might imagine 
you've ever watched them dig up streets with pipe type. So was it a plastic pipe? Was it a lead pipe? Was it metal? Was it asbestos? Yes, they have asbestos pipes. Uh, we were told multiple times that there's nothing to worry about. What was the social economic uh, area like? You know, was it filled with students? Was it families? Was it older population? You know, all these things you can imagine might affect uh, water usage, which then in turn might affect leakage. We had weather data. So you can imagine if it's cold and freezing, we might have more leaks. So if it's hot and sunny, we might have more or less. Not sure. Was there lots of business in that area? So what were there sort of mainly shops or was it industry? So factories or, you know, was it a mixture? And then we had a directory of stuff. And I'm calling it stuff because to be honest, I can't quite remember. I just remember there was more stuff that was just someone who thought, well, this might be interesting. And you can see looking at all this data that intuitively they should all help us understand what's going on with leakage. Right? You know, intuitively the pipe type, if it's an older pipe, might help us predict where a leak is going to happen. Or the pipe location, perhaps it's in a busy road where it's often being dug up, that might help us. Perhaps there's reported leaks. You could imagine going over an historical uh, record and seeing that leaks are, are occurring over and over again in the same place. Okay. Or perhaps with businesses, if you've got a factory that's using lots of water but turning it off and on, again, that might be an indication that a leak is going to occur. So all these things are, are intuitively sensible things to look at. And the problem set up was a classic sort of machine learning. So we had a big pile of data in the corner. The idea would be we'd suck it up, we'd put it into a magical AI machine, uh, which doesn't look quite so magical in this picture, but a magical AI machine that would sort of throw it all together, uh, do a little bit of cleaning, and then we'll distill it into some sort of understanding, insight, fault detection, all these different bits and pieces. And that's, that's quite a, a sensible strategy. So it's a very classic machine learning data science workflow. Okay, we have data, those data are the previous results, and we want to use the past in order to predict the future. So given that we know all these leaks have occurred in the last 10 years, given that we know all the different sort of covariates surrounding that, so covariates are just related variables, so weather, uh, pipe type, pipe size, location, we know all this information, can we put it all together in a nice, sensible way, and can we use that to predict the future? So it's a, it's a classic machine learning pipeline. So this is something that, well, to be honest, that's what I've been doing for the last 20 years. Okay, so I've got a background in statistics and computation, and this is the sort of task I enjoy. So it was great, you know, I worked hard all day, you know, I started off at 9.30 in the morning, I had a laptop, I had a whole host of data, I could process the data. So I program a lot in a language called R and Python, so I could process all that data, and I was a coding machine, okay? So I was getting in spreadsheets, Excel spreadsheets, CSV files, some spatial data, I was putting it all together. I even did some AI, or regression, as some people might call it. So I did some regression, some AI, just to try and get a feel for, can we predict what's, what potential there is for the data? You know, is there some sort of signal within all this noise? If you recall, I wasn't at this hackathon by myself. Okay, so I came with my colleague, Seb. And Seb had a slightly different strategy and his strategy didn't involve sitting at his laptop and it didn't involve getting all the data and it didn't involve pulling CSV files and trying to make sense of them. Instead, it involved drinking lots of coffee. It involved eating lots of hobnobs and also asking lots of questions. So where we were doing this hackathon, we were in a big room and each team was sort of roughly at a table by itself. And there were around about sort of six to eight different experts from Northumberland Water who all understood the data in a different way. So someone might have been in charge of collating the leakage report. Someone else might have been in charge of fixing the leaks. 
Okay, so with all these different experts. So Seb essentially had his coffee in one hand, his hobnobs in the other, and just walked around talking to all these people. And I was a bit vexed, uh, you know, so I started a company to, to essentially get, avoid doing work. And here's Seb walking around with his coffee and his hobnobs, having a nice little time where I'm sort of trying to pull this data. And the data was in a polite way, untidy. Uh, it's amazing how many different ways someone can spell postcode when you're putting data together. So I was doing all the work and I wanted to eat hobnobs as well, because let's face it, who doesn't want to eat hobnobs? So if we think back, what was the goal of this hackathon? Well, the goal of this hackathon was quite straightforward. It was to reduce leaks by 20%. Okay. And a related question is why do they want to reduce leaks by 20%? And initially you think that's quite an obvious question until you sort of think about, well, why? And well, Seb found out, and the reason they wanted to reduce leaks by 20% is they're going to get charged a lot of money. Okay. So the government are going to come down and say you have far too much leakage in your pipes and we're going to fine you a lot of money. So it's lots of cash. So although the stated aim was to reduce leaks by 20%, this wasn't really what they were after. They were after reduce the amount lost due to leakage. Okay. And that's a similar but slightly different aim. So the first one, reduce the leaks by 20%, is trying to sort of, it leads you down the path of trying to predict where the next leak is happening to then stop the overall number of leaks. Whereas the second one is trying to reduce the amount, the overall amount. So you could have lots of leaks, but if they only reduce a leak by, you know, if, if a leak's only two milliliters of water, who cares? So the goal is reduce the amount lost due to leakage. So how do we estimate leakage? Right, something else that Seb found out. How do we estimate? Well, it was per DMA, right? So that's this district metered area, this sort of collection of postcodes. And as I mentioned, it's the minimum flow rate at around about sort of two or three o'clock in the morning. So it's not the most, putting it lightly, precise measurement. Okay. And if we were to sort of flip this around and think about it from a machine learning data science point of view, the way we build these sorts of models is we're trying to predict leakage, right? So a way of thinking about AI, machine learning, statistics, is we have something that we're trying to predict. Here, the thing that we're trying to predict is the amount of leakage. But the amount of leakage is very, very imprecise, right? It's not accurate at all. So we could build a model, it could be the best model ever, it could capture absolutely everything, but the thing that we're training it on is not precise in the slightest. So this isn't magic. So our, already our model is not going to be great because we don't really know how much leakage there is. Also, what do you need to fix, fix leaks? Well, you need an engineer. That's quite obvious, you know, you need someone to go in the van, drive out, fix the leaks. And would you believe you also need data? Okay. So what data does an engineer need? Well, when an engineer goes out to fix leaks, they want things like the flow rate of that area. They want to know what pipe type, you know, what sort of pipes to expect in order to fix them. They want to know historical leakage, you know, as a colleague at that particular point last week, trying to fix the same leak, right? So they want to know some historical data. They also want to know a bunch of other stuff, right? You know, what is the weather going to be like? You know, is it going to be sort of thunderstorms? Is it going to be really warm? What is the traffic? So allegedly, they're not just allowed to dig up roads. They have to wait until quiet times. So if it's on the M1, well, they can't just sort of dig up the road. They have to sort of uh, figure out when it's going to be quiet and do it accordingly. Do they need to look at the crime of the area? So basically, do they need to bring a friend to watch the van? And this takes them round about 
two hours per day to get this information. Right, so an engineer starts off by saying, by getting told, there's a leak in this area, and then they spend around about two hours trying to pull together all this information. And this is 35 engineers. Right? So we're talking about a significant amount of engineering time used to sort of collate all this data and put it in a, a reasonable format for them to use. Okay. And all this information I've just listed is all the information that we've been given to try and help fix leakage. So data is hard. Right. And most of you will work for organisations where you have lots of data, but it's everywhere and it's hard. And I think the best way of showing how hard is to watch this little clip. Arium, how are we doing on that data core audit? The probe used multiple SQL injections, but I've yet to find any compromised files. So, it's the 24th century, and they're still having SQL problems, right? So just let that sink in, you know. 24th century, 400 years from now, they still can't work a database. That's how hard data is. So, what's our solution? Our solution is to reduce engineering time. Right? So that two hours at the start of the day, we want to be able to shrink that down to 10 or 15 minutes. So we want the engineer to, to, to walk up, type in where they're going to go, and then get all the data that they need. And this is relatively easy, okay? It's about collating all the data, putting it all together, and it's definitely doable, okay? We can definitely do this. You know, they have the data, we just need to put it into the right format so they can definitely do this. This is we can definitely do this. Of course, this leaves us with a slight problem. So Seb found all this wonderful stuff out on the first day. We now only have half a day in which to build the app because remember we had two days of hack time with the second half of the presentation. So what we need to do is we need to decide what we're going to make in the app and then decide what we're going to bluff, okay? And we're not going to be dishonest, we know we're going to be clear about what we're going to bluff, but figure out what's important and what, what's sort of obvious. So, what do we make? Well, we can demo a single DMA. We can get data for a single DMA. We don't really need more. If we can do one, we can do all of them. Okay, it's about the proof of concept. So, demo a single DMA. That reduces the time down a lot. We can display where the pipes are, for example. And if you can do that, then it's obvious that we can display the pipe type. Okay, so it's all about sort of giving people a feel for how this would work while at the same time not worrying about tiny little details, but giving people a flavour of what's possible. So these are screenshots of the winning app. Okay, so these are screenshots of, of the one that we did. And we have already quite a little bit of bluffing going on in this front page, okay? And for example, in the top left-hand corner, we've got a little icon that shows someone logging on. And we didn't spend those three hours setting up a user authentication system. We can do that. We do that for all our clients, but we don't need to do this for a dummy app, right? But this is just given an indication of it's possible. We also have a table here showing high-priority DMAs, and we didn't spend time figuring out how to do the high-priority DMAs, but we can do that. Nothing from what already do that. So again, this was just giving a flavour of what's possible. Right? And already the engineer could go on, see what priority DMAs are there, and they can start getting some information, a feel for what's going on. What else did we do? Well, we had some nice... Uh, graphs so this was stuff that the engineer would be, be interested in so this was historical leakage and then the one below that was pressure flow and we had a whole sort of column of graphs okay and these two at the top were all whizzy and interactive so they were javascript and so you could highlight the ones at the bottom were static and just sort of giving an indication we threw a trend line on top to help view and if you can look carefully at these slides or these graphs, you can see a little blue button on each of them. And the idea here would be that an engineer might want to print out particular uh, graphics or particular data sets to go to their job because they might not have good reception. And so you could slide that little blue button backwards and forwards 
and that would indicate whether you wanted that that graph printed or not. We'd also have some spatial data. So here the idea would be that on uh, you might take a picture of a leak and then you could upload it to a database. And obviously we didn't implement a database that we could store pictures, but we could, and that's that's sort of an obvious thing, but it's just giving people a flavor. So our solution was not to try and do any of the AI, not to try and predict leaks, but it was to reduce that two hour chunk at the start of the day down to 15 minutes. That would then increase the engineer time by over 20%, and hopefully reduce leakage by what they're after. So this app, uh, this is the, the winning team, and so that's me on the sort of the, the right hand side with Nexus Seb. So this app is now starting to be used. Okay, and what's nice is now that this data, I'm going to use the word pipeline, this data pipeline has been put into into action. What it means is that we can then start building on AI and machine learning. Right? We now have this nice, solid foundation on which to do some predictive modeling. And then we can start adding this on to this, this dashboard. So it's nice. So that was in 2018. And I suppose I should mention that we also won it in 2019. So this was last year. Uh, so it's Seb again. And then it's Jack and Andrew who won that one. So that was quite good. Uh, and we also won this one as well. This was the... Uh, uh, the environmental agency. So we do have won quite a lot of water related projects. And in both of these projects, or both of these hacks, again, it was the same idea going. It was, here's a lot of data. Can you predict, build something using AI machine learning? And if that's really the problem, then you go to Amazon and buy a book, right? But this typically is trying to sort of figure out, well, that's not going to work. What will work? What nice solution can we come up with? So I'm going to do a little bit of technical part for the, for the last part. So we're going to get a little bit technical. So what is the AI process that we're talking about? So the AI process, so it's doing really technical. We have now have people holding coffee cups. Uh, the AI process always starts with data gathering. Right? So it starts with, we're pulling in lots of data from disparate regions, and we're going to use that. This then gets put into some sort of data cleaning and processing step. Okay, so we have to clean, tidy that data. And then after that, we then get to do some cool AI machine learning. Okay, so that's quite nice. That's uh, the AI process. Now, a question could be, which of these steps could we skip? Do we really need to do all three? Right. So let's start. Let's suppose we skip steps two and three can we still do something sensible, right? So we've just gathered in lots of data and I'm almost sure that everybody who's watching this, this, this talk will be in this situation. You've got lots and lots of data, unstructured, messy, all over your organization. You've gathered it, built it, let them come and use it. So here's a nice little graph from uh, it's a share price and it's a, the Zoom's share price during the, the, the last few months during COVID. And Zoom, you're, you're, I'm sure you're aware of, is a video platform. And you can see that this is sort of end of March, beginning of April, the share price rocketed, right? So Zoom went through the roof because everybody thought, great, you know, video conferencing, Zoom technologies, we must buy shares because that's a issue. Right? It's, a, it's a good thing to invest in. Unfortunately, that was the wrong company. And so what they really wanted to buy shares in was a company, ZM which was Zoom Video Communications, not Zoom Technologies. So without good data, you do silly, daft things. Here's another one. So this was a front page of the New York Times. And I think this is quite a powerful front page. You know, it's got the list of names in the US who have died from COVID-19, right? You know, no comment, just, here is a list of names, and this is a few weeks ago. And I think that's, you know, it's a very powerful statement of what's going on. Someone looked into these names, and I think this is name number six. Name number six was this person, Jordan Driver Haynes. And after a quick Google found that he hadn't died of COVID, he had died in a homicide. 
And the point here is that the New York Times had this really powerful front page telling people about what's happening. Because the data has been incorrect, you could then imagine people saying, well, it's not that, you know, if they've made that mistake, then how many other mistakes, you know, was it really that bad? Did 100,000 people really die? Or actually, is it just sort of the normal day to day? And so you've automatically made people skeptical of what's happened. And what the New York Times did, the reason why they made that mistake was essentially did a search for anything with COVID-19 and the, the, the death certificate. And when they came to Jordan, what happened was Jordan's funeral was delayed due to COVID and that's how it got picked up. Right. So just reporting data isn't good enough. So let's suppose we, we gather data and then we have some data cleaning and processing. And this was how we won this hackathon. We had the data and we cleaned it. And with these two steps, you can do some really nice things. Right. Here's the New York Times again. And I think this front page is absolutely fantastic. Right. You know, this simple graph shows how the job losses have increased due to COVID-19. Right. You know, you've got the job losses, this graph going down the bottom over the last uh, few years, I think it's going back to around about 2000. The, the grayed out box is where we had the, the sort of the last recession around about sort of 2009. And then you've got this massive spike as millions of people started claiming for unemployment benefit. No AI whatsoever, but it really does get the point across. Here's another graph. I, and I can't remember who, who created this graph, so it's got no credit, but it wasn't me. So if someone knows who, who to credit, I'll more than happy to. But this is showing the, the daily flights for the last couple of years. All right. So you've got 2010, and it shows you the volcanic ash, if you remember the volcanic ash that uh, caused chaos with flights. You've got last year, and then you've got the COVID-19 crisis. And again, three lines, we can automatically see the impact that COVID-19 is having on transport. No AI, no machine learning, no data science, just good data with a clear uh, communication. So with good data, amazing insights can happen. Okay, We don't need to do anything clever, we just need to be clear about what we're doing. So let's suppose then we have all three. So hopefully you'd never just sort of get some data and hope for the best. You'd also have that cleaning and processing step. What happens when you can add on AI and machine learning? Well, with all three, we can do some nice predictions. We can predict things like fraudulent activity. We're working with a company to, to try and predict new designs in manufacturing. So experiments that they've not yet done. And crucially, we can predict what's going to happen tomorrow. So whenever you're interested in what's happening today, it almost always means you're interested in what's happening tomorrow. So the data cleaning and data processing tells you about today, the AI and machine learning tells you about tomorrow. And what we're also interested in is automating. Can we make decisions in real time? Can we anticipate issues before they occur? Can we plan about potential problems that are going to crop up? With all these things, though, we still have to think about the data. Right? We can't just take a step back and let magic. AI, machine learning is not magic. We still have to understand what's going on. So, for example, so over the last few weeks, or the last few months, I've been trying to get fitter. So I've been trying to use my, my time a little bit better. And these are, I've got fancy scales, because clearly when you're wanting to lose weight, well, you spend lots of money getting other things to make you lose weight. So we've got fancy scales where you step on, it records your weight and pings them up to an app. And if you go, this is, these are Worthing scales, and if you go to the, the website, they, they talk about AI, you know, and all these sorts of fancy things. So this is a, a, a snapshot from my app, and it's not going particularly well. You know, so I had a, a good, good January where I lost a, a kilo, and then February, March, and April hasn't been that great, to be perfectly honest. You know, look, this plus, plus, and plus is not the best, okay? And you're probably even thinking of, you only lost weight in January because your Christmas was so appallingly bad. Might well be true. So that's not great. You think, oh. But then you look at the graph, and you think, well, 
that line in my actual weight has been going down, but the numbers are, have been positive. So the numbers at the top say I've put on, what, a kilo and a half, but the graph looks like it's a negative. And this just doesn't strike me with particular confidence. You know, so Worthings are talking about AI buying all the other latest equipment, but they can't even plot data. So whenever you see something about AI, think, how do they handle the normal data sets? You know, are they using it a sensible way? If they can't get the basics right, what does that tell you about the more advanced stuff? And also remember, whenever you think about AI, humans are important. So this story came out, what, a week and a half ago, two weeks ago? And it was about Microsoft, and they'd sacked or replaced all of their uh, editors for MSN. And I know what you're thinking, who reads MSN? But it turns out that some people actually do read MSN. So all the dozens of journalists have been sacked, and they're going to be replaced by AI. Two weeks after this, Microsoft's robot editor confuses Little Mix singers. Not the best look. And what they had to do was they had to bring in the human beings back into the, the mix to try and sort of solve this complete mess up. So humans are important. Data is important. Understanding what's going on is important. So, summary. Think about your problem. What are you trying to solve? Don't jump in with both feet. That's what I tended to do. And also, don't send me to a hackathon without others. So I've been to two, I've won one and lost one, and whenever I'm by myself, I lose. So th this data. So thank you very much. Hopefully you found this talk interesting and useful. If you're interested in anything AI, machine learning, please just drop me a line at my email address down below. Thank you.